Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Peter Kern, the director of the Global Public Health Program. Uh, and on behalf of the External Advisory Committee of the Global Health Program and the Institute for Health and Humanities, I'm co sponsor of the lecture series, I'd like to invite you to tonight's lecture. Uh, the last in the, what I think has been a really dynamite series of lectures this past semester. And if you weren't able to get to some of those lectures, um, thanks to uh, a grant from uh, Missoula um, MCAT, uh, we are able to videotape the lectures. And so we, after a little bit of a delay, they're all available on the Global Public Health website. So you can go back and see the ones that you missed. And uh, you can continue to go back several years, as a matter of fact, to see past lectures. So tonight, uh, Jonah Atterbury is going to be talking to us. He is Assistant Professor in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care at the University of Nebraska's Medical Center, where he is a practicing pediatric intensivist. After medical school at Oregon Health and Sciences University and residency at the University of Nebraska, he completed his critical care fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. During this time, he also completed a research fellowship investigating physiological markers of nutritional recovery in severely malnourished children in Malawi. Other global health experience includes research on traumatic brain injury in East Africa and South America, which he continues to conduct. Additional research interests include the reduction of morbidity in children returning to medically underserved communities following critical illness. Following the completion of his training, he spent a year working in Missoula at the PICU at the Community Medical Center. In his spare time, he enjoys travel, cooking, fly fishing, and rooting for the St. Louis Cardinal. I have to tell you that I don't know how many of our lecturers have said they enjoyed fishing and uh, cooking and travel. But he's the first one that roots in the St. Louis Cardinal. But anyway, uh, join me in welcoming Jonah. <laughs> Thank you. It's always funny to hear somebody talk about you when you're standing there. Um, can you guys hear me okay? My voice doesn't travel very well, so I'm wearing two mics. Everyone can hear me okay? Um, and I'd love to stand up there, but unfortunately to run the slideshow, I have to stand back here. So I'm going to try to creep along the desk here um, to try to not be barricaded behind these uh, computers. So thank you again for coming in um, from the beautiful weather outside. It is gorgeous. Um, I did not bring my fly rod with me this time. I should have. Did not expect it to be so gorgeous out today. Um, but I, I came today to talk to you about the transitions and the overlaps between global health and rural health. Um, having participated in global health research and global health um, healthcare in general, um, and then having worked here for a year in Missoula, I think there's a lot of overlap between the two that, uh, that is worth discussing. So uh, my title, Head in the Heart, What Global Health Research Has to Teach Us About Healthcare in Montana. It also, alternative title was Three Easy Steps to Saving Babies Around the World. You Won't Believe Step Two. Um, I felt like that was a snazzier title, but less descriptive. So a couple of disclosures. I did get funded um, for a couple of the things you'll see here today. Um, and I'm going to start with a question to you guys. Now, unfortunately, being out of state now, I haven't been able to see some of the lectures. Um, but I'm curious of those of you who have been to some of these lectures, um, what you've noticed, if it any themes of people who've spoken uh, in the series. Um, specifically, what, what words would you use to describe them? What characteristics would you say you had, they had in common when they uh, spoke to you about the work that they did? I think one thing that all the speakers would say about their overseas experience, particularly in Africa, is the resilience of the people that they work with, uh, who are faced with um, unbelievable challenges for their health care compared to what we have in this country. And they get along. And um, the second thing would be uh, for the researcher or the person who's providing the care to understand that they can't go into that country and say, well, here's the way we do it. The 
and unless they end up working with the people in that country to figure out what's the best way, it's not going to stick. So some adaptability on the, on the part of the, the person coming from the West and going. All right. Anything else you've noticed as themes in the people who have shared their global health experiences? Enthusiasm and commitment. Enthusiasm for the particular discipline or approach that they take. And then commitment to the people that they serve. So it's not just like, oh, we're going there for two days and then back a lot. They're often there for the longer term. So prolonged engagement, uh, commitment, as you said. Anything else that's been noticed? It, it seems that many of the issues that are addressed are the solvable with uh, more facilitation and uh, education involvement or collaboration. Mm -hmm. These issues you might imagine decades from now won't have to be issues if people can work together. So solvable issues. Let me ask you guys another question. Um, what do you think motivates the people who've gone to do work in global health? What motivates them to solve those issues? If they're easily solvable, what motivates them to put, in, put forth that effort? I can tell you it's not money. I was just going to say <laughs> that. <laughs> they're solvable, but maybe not easily. Yeah. And so if you go over and try to do some things, you recognize that some things could happen, you could perhaps make some things happen, but you better be prepared to stay for the longer term. Okay. I think, so, I, I think there was a certain level of, of altruism involved in, in most people's motivations that genuinely caring about the world and hoping to make it a better place in okay. some way. You know? So maybe empathy, commitment we talked about. So. I divided this into the, the two things that I think motivate us to, to get involved in global health. I think there's the head piece and there's the heart piece. Um, the head piece uh, for some is, is over, overriding and that is the practical, sets, uh, practical approach that says, there's a problem here, I can solve it. Um, I can take an academic or scientific view of this and I can apply that to solving this issue. And we oftentimes will think of that as a research or policy-based approach to global health. Then there's the heart piece of global health, which is the empathetic piece you discussed, the part that is the impassioned piece, the part that says, honestly, going abroad is kind of adventurous and it's romantic, and it's, um, it's something that, that spurs the insides the way that, I don't know, going to a nine to five job and working behind a computer all day doesn't do, have the same effect on people. Um, and I think a lot of those, tend towards kind of the medical mission model. Um, people who say, there's a problem here, I want to solve it because I feel uh, empathy towards this, the situation there. They both have their downsides. So I think the head model, the head model of research and policy says, abstinence, be faithful, and condoms is going to cure AIDS in Africa. And we all know that it didn't work very well. But that was, a, that was the, the extreme of somebody taking a policy uh, and somebody's taking misguided research and trying to apply it. Likewise, there is the other side of the, um, the heart model. And I don't know if any of you follow Barbie Savior on Instagram. Anybody? <laughs> Just me? So Barbie Savior is awesome because it, it's, a, it's a parody account that, that kind of ridicules some of the intentions and some of the, the, the things, the reasons people go abroad. Um, this one in particular, this one post on Instagram was, uh, as many of you know, I was hospitalized long ago to, to completely non-preventable illness, but everything happens for a reason. There are no trained medical professionals or hospitals in Africa, so I'm drawing on my vast amount of knowledge gained during those two days to cure and heal those around me with a slew of hashtags. <clears throat> and this is kind of the other extreme. This is too much heart, maybe, and not enough head. So can we marry the two in a meaningful way? Like, can we use both of those things to our advantage? Here's my obligatory head and heart photo for any of you who are familiar with that band. Um, but the question really is, can we marry these things together and why bother? What's the reasons for doing those two? I would say yes, we can do it, and I think that we should. 
Um, that's why I'm here today, and I think that's probably what most of you um, would probably agree with me in that sentiment. Um, I think there are several reasons. One is that well-designed global health activities can improve the health of those that they serve. You guys have probably heard some of those stories over the last few weeks in this lecture series. Research in particular helps identify who to serve and how to do it. You mentioned before kind of being adaptable to what the needs of the community are. You can't just walk in and say, I'm going to give everybody penicillin unless you know they need, all need penicillin. So research helps us identify those things. Global health activities also have a tangible benefit to both the outside community they're helping as well as the local community from which those people are coming. Um, and the research helps us know if we're doing it right. So we can go do an intervention somewhere, but without the research to, to coincide with that, we don't know if we're actually helping anybody there or here. And lastly, it takes a literal village, um, and you are no village. Um, it's not a one-man show for any of this. Um, I, again, I don't want to tip my hands too much, but there... <laughs> There is, I think, a lot of stress around uh, short, some short-term medical missions where you have one surgeon going into a community, performing a bunch of surgeries, leaving and leaving the vacuum behind. I think that that is not the right model. Um, building infrastructure is what really keeps these projects alive and what really helps those communities and also uh, helps us bring that information back to us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you three scenarios, uh, three different case studies of places I've worked and with people with whom I've worked um, to help uh, illuminate some of these ideas. <clears throat> in Malawi, uh, I'm going to talk to, you, talk to you about identifying the problem. Um, identifying what you think the problem is that needs to be solved. In South America, we're going to talk about creatively convincing people that what you want to do is important. Um, specifically, convincing those people who might give you money to do what you need to do. And then in East Africa, we're going to talk about building something um, and working hard to build something, but making sure that it's going to survive beyond you. So we'll start in Malawi. <clears throat> I got the chance to spend um, six months in Malawi a couple, a little over a year ago now. Um, and I was there working on malnutrition, as Peter mentioned earlier. Uh, malnutrition, huge issue, right? The problem is, is right there. 20 million kids annually have severe acute malnutrition. 25% um, of childhood deaths globally um, have some uh, nutrition component to it, and malnutrition will play into that in one way or another. The thing of interest to me as a pediatric intensivist working in the ICU primarily is death. That's a lot of what I do in the ICU is trying to avoid death in the last, hopefully not the last few uh, days of a child's life. And so my point of interest when I started to read the literature was that despite giving these kids appropriate nutrition, despite giving them antibiotics, despite giving them um, consistent follow-up with, with health care or even inpatient hospitalization, five to seven percent of these kids who were being treated for severe malnutrition were dying during therapy. We didn't know why. We had some theories. Um, sepsis was a big one that we uh, just thought was, was a likely culprit, but we needed a way to identify these kids who might be at high risk of dying when they're six hours by foot, by ox cart, by motorbike away from the hospital, as opposed to being six minutes away, which most of us would be now. So the way we did that is kind of married a couple of projects. Um, I used a technology called heart rate variability assessment. So heart rate variability, I'll show you more on the next slide, a little bit about that. But it's a tool that we thought we could use to better identify kids who are at risk of death than the way we are doing it right now, the way the WHO recommends doing it, which is um, also something I'm going to show you a picture of here in a moment. Very quickly, this is not the forum to go into the specific of this other than to know that the brain is consistently feeding uh, information to the heart about how fast that it should beat. Um, that is then seen, uh, we can see that on the uh, ECG or EKG readings down here. And then if you take this information and you actually start to measure some of the gaps between um, the heartbeats, you get what's up above, which is heart rate variability plots which tell us how much the heart rate is, flux is fluctuating between beats. That in turn tells you information about how well the brain is doing. So if the brain is starting to fail, you're gonna see some sort of changes in the heart rate variability, um, assuming your heart is normal. This was our hypothesis. The way we did it was we had clinics set up in different locations in Malawi where kids were being treated for severe malnutrition. 
they would go through kind of a three-step process. Initially, they'd be screened, and this patient's being screened with a MUAC tape. Has anybody seen MUAC tapes before? Maybe, yeah, at least one of you. So MUAC tape is, is a very simple tool that's used. It's a strip of plastic about this long. You put it around the upper arm, the mid-upper arm circumference, and you pull it, and you see there it, the, the indicator is landed on red. That means bad. This patient is severe, severely malnourished. You also can see the yellow and the green up there. It's a very simple tool the WHO has, has proposed and has used for years to help identify malnutrition. But that alone wasn't picking out which kids were going to die. The, um, the degree of how much they were in the red or how much they were in the green had no correlation um, with, the, with the patients who were dying. So what we would do is we'd, we would measure the heart rate variability at the point of screening. And then they'd receive therapy. And therapy was in the form of RUTF, or ready to use therapeutic foods, basically a really thick, super sweet peanut butter um, that these patients would get. And then at the time of graduation, hopefully graduation, um, when they had, um, their malnutrition had been corrected, uh, we would measure their heart rate, heart rate variability at that point as well. So we'd have a pre and a post reading for these patients. Uh, this is a quick video that shows you the process. It worked for me earlier. There we go. So the way we measured this was with an with a iPod, basically, connected to a finger probe, the same way you would uh, measure your oxygen saturation in a hospital right now. Um, same type of probe, it fed information into this iPod. You see here uh, little squiggles that represents um, uh, pulse rate variability, so it's a derivative of heart rate variability. Um, and then that information was, was recorded, and we can get all that, those bigger plots and graphs that I showed you before. That gives us some information about how stable these patients might be. Um, this was pretty much every patient that we recorded this data on was in this setting, under a tree somewhere um, in the middle of Malawi. This is actually one of the cooler days, which was awesome. Um, again, more scatter plots, not the time to go into it, other than to tell you that what we expected to see on this plot was that this pre-treatment um, group here would actually have a lower high frequency number than our post-treatment. Our post-treatment actually should be higher as we gain more high frequency um, readings on the heart rate variability. It didn't happen. Um, and that didn't make a whole lot of sense. So what we started to look at was we gathered information on 600 patients. The curiosity is, is this trend gonna hold up with a larger data set? Do we need to get, collect more data? Was that our problem? Um, or does this high frequency power, I guess why does it appear to decrease as the patients recover? So again, it should have increased and we're not really sure what the difference was. And then is there a pattern of baroreceptor dysfunction malnourished children? So is there something wrong that's different about these kids' brains that we don't see in other kids that are appropriately nourished? Ultimately, for someone like myself, who'd gotten two different grants to, to fund this study, who'd spent six months of time collecting on this data um, and coming home with it, what do I do with all of this now? So I have this, all this data, I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of someone else's money to collect it, and I'm hoping that we had some sort of answer. We didn't have this answer, so what do we do with it now? Just as an academic exercise, what, what we are doing is taking this and using the data set to write two different papers have nothing to do with what our primary hypothesis was. We have a data set now that we can use to give information about healthcare seeking behavior, some more public health information, um, as well as how sick these patients might be, be with are coming into the feeding clinics. More importantly though, um, we stepped back and said, is this still a problem that needs to be addressed? Um, does this five to 7% mortality in these patients really need to be addressed or is it something that um, we should just accept as part of the, the, the treatment. If so, is there a better way to address it if we still want to address it? Is there, should we not be using the, the technology we did? Should we, should we be testing a different physiologic mechanism? Um, and then importantly, and this is gonna be a theme a little bit today too, how do I convince somebody else to fund me again if this is something I wanna do? This is something I really believe in. How do I get other people to believe in it as well enough that I can go over there and do it? Um, and that's a bit of a challenge, but it gets, the conversation started about how we might do this. So Malawi, Montana, very different places. They both start with them. Similarities uh, end close to there. 
Um, populations, a lot more in Malawi. It's a small, thin country with a high population in a small amount of time. However, these roads, these roads are awful. Um, this is a very real situation we're into going in and out of um, the different villages we were in. Montana, smaller, less people, well, sorry, less people, bigger land mass, but these roads also are pretty awful, and um, you all have experienced that. Why does that matter? Because that's the way people are getting to and from medical centers. Um, someone who's out in the middle of Montana is going to be trying to travel on the same roads that aren't that dissimilar from the ones in Malawi. So there's an issue here that is an access to care issue. And the access to care issue isn't, isn't unique to Malawi. It's not unique to the kids who are, have severe, severe malnutrition. It's also occurring here in Montana. South America is the next place we're going to talk about. <clears throat> in South America, we're going to talk about how you creatively convince someone else that what you want to do is important, that whatever your question is or whatever your, your problem that you want to solve is important. Nancy Carney is a PhD, and she is a, um, a mentor of mine that I met in medical school. <clears throat> Nancy's awesome. Um, she is one of the most gracious people I've ever met. She has um, been at OHSU, where I did my medical school, um, for years and years. Um, she really made a name for herself in research looking at traumatic brain injury, or TBI. Um, since 2003, she's been on every version of traumatic brain injury treatment guidelines that have come out and has been very well funded as a result of that. <clears throat> She's gotten multiple large, large NIH grants um, and multiple private grants to support her work. New England Journal of Medicine is kind of like the holy grail of publications for an MD. Um, it is, it's the, one of the best journals you can publish in. And Nancy had this great article that she did um, in 2012, it came out, looking at uh, monitoring the pressure inside the brain in patients in Argentina. It took a group of patients that uh, had, had brain injuries. Some of them, they put um, monitors that went into, into the skull and measured the pressure. Some of them, they didn't, and they, they measured which patients did better. If we know the, the, head, the pressure inside the head, does that help us, or does it even matter at all? What they found was that the, the study was well designed, but the intervention didn't show any benefit. There was no benefit to putting these, these pressure monitors inside the skull. And so this huge study, again, very well funded, had a negative result. <clears throat> she moved on to a different population in Argentina, um, looking at kids who had had traumatic brain injury. Um, they had a, a set post-discharge plan that included um, some social work in interventions, some uh, physical therapy interventions uh, for kids with severe uh, deficiencies. And they used the data from the previous studies to say, we expect to get X number of patients enrolled in this study. They got about four years in the study and realized they're getting nowhere close to that number of patients. And so the funding ran out. They ran out of funding, they had to shut down the study, and basically publish a paper that says, look, we had this set up, here are the reasons why we set up the way we did, but we just didn't get enough patients to make any good conclusions on this. It's not necessarily three strikes you're out, but NIH funding especially has a way of drying up. Um, this is, uh, again, a topic for a whole hour in and of itself. But looking at the way that NIH funding has gone over the past was 50 years, uh, 70 years almost, um, NIH funding rose, and in the time where she started her studies here, um, there was a pretty good spike in funding, and she was a beneficiary of that. And now, uh, that funding really has gone down. Um, if you look at a lot of the NIH funding mechanisms, um, it's, been, it's been increasingly difficult um, to get new NIH funding. <clears throat> and so this has left uh, Dr. Carney in a, in a unique position in that she has this developed, well-developed research plan. She has this well-developed research consortium. However, finding new ways to fund it are going to be a challenge. And so she took a different tact. So this is a paper that just came out this year that she wrote excuse me, looking at geographical disparity in traumatic brain injury in American rural areas, um, looking at basically kind of a, a duh moment for us here, but they, they suffer worse outcomes. Orienting into the graph here, this is fatality rate per 100,000 people. And these are three different groups. So this is all traumatic brain injuries. These are unintentional injuries. These are violent injuries. 
Each of these are divided. So this is a rural population and a urban population. So for all traumatic brain injuries, our rural populations have much higher, significantly higher um, rates of, of case fatality. Unintentional, same thing. Statistically significant um, increase and also significant here um, for the violent injuries. Our rural populations uh, definitely have higher risk of dying if you get hit in the head when you're in, again, the middle of Montana versus when you're in uh, Missoula, like a big metropolitan area like Missoula. Um, this map, you're going to see two maps here, I think is uh, we're kind of the, the meat of her study, in my opinion. So this is an age-adjusted traumatic brain injury fatality rate. Basically, red means that you're at the highest risk of traumatic brain injury death if you're in one of those areas. This is all broken down by county. So you might see Montana up there in the heart of all of the red. So this is our rural healthcare access to TBI treatment, so traumatic brain injury treatment. And this identifies that a little bit more clearly. So the areas with these kind of tiger stripes on them are represented, representative of, of rural communities or rural counties. As you see, again, the area in which we are right now is really the meat of that. Um, the areas along the coasts here, obviously not as much of a risk here, have better access to healthcare. Um, and again, this was not a, a unknown phenomenon, but not something that had really been published before. The conclusions of this paper I thought was very telling. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you here. The TBI fatality rates are higher in rural areas of the United States, reflected related, sorry, excuse me, relative to urban areas. The disparity is likely due in part to differences in resource availability. Additional studies are needed to one, better characterize the unmet needs of rural Americans who sustain TBI, and two, develop treatment guidelines that can effectively address unique conditions and resource limitations contributing to poor outcomes from the TBI in these communities. Similarly, investigations done in resource-constrained, low, middle-income countries have important implications for improving outcomes from TBI in rural areas of high-income countries. So that's us, that's Montana. We are the rural area of a high-income country. And what she's saying in this paper is really, if we, can know, if we know how to do this uh, TBI treatment in somewhere like Argentina, Colombia, um, Guatemala, we should know how to do it here um, in Montana as well. We need to study it more. We have access to those things. This global health is translational. And again, access to appropriate health care is a global issue. Um, the outcomes in uh, Colombia are not that different from the outcomes here in Montana. So we'll move on to the last one here. <clears throat> I'm probably going to finish ahead of time. This is great. <laughs> um, so my last... Uh, my last place we're going to go here is East Africa um, to talk about building something and working hard to build it, but giving it life beyond yourself. So Delon Elagala was one of my first um, mentors. He is a man as tall as I am, probably weighs a third of what I weigh. Um, he is incredibly charismatic. Um, a neurosurgeon uh, that I met as a medical student, and when you're a medical student, neurosurgeons are really cool, especially when they invite you to the OR and tell you to touch somebody's brain, which was a really cool moment in my life. Um, he was at OHSU when I was there as a medical student. We ended up going to Tanzania, um, all actually all over East Africa together. His story is interesting. He finished his fellowship, finished his medical training, and wanted some time off before he started his first job. So his girlfriend was going to East Africa to go do some medical mission something, and so he followed her out there. Had no intentions of doing anything other than really sleeping during the day, maybe going on safari. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Um, You've heard this story before. Um, long story short, he ends up breaking up with his girlfriend, um, not while he was there, because that would be really awkward. Um, but he, well, he was there, he accidentally started this, this program training non MDs to do basic neurosurgical procedures. Um, when I have an accident, I forget to set my alarm in the morning. When Delon has an accident, he ends up training somebody to do neurosurgery that's never cut into someone's head before. So we all have our place in life, I guess. When I was there with him the first time, um, we looked at some of the outcomes from this. Um, this paper that we, we put together uh, was looking at the patients who'd been operated on by the Tanzanian non-MD. So he's basically a, 
advanced practice practitioner or a mid-level practitioner um, who hadn't gone to medical school but had been trained to do certain procedures, this list of procedures here, uh, they were considered neurosurgical, sorry, neurosurgical procedures in a um, very rural area in Tanzania. Um, my goal when I was there was to find these patients and see how they were doing. Um, it's a very coarse definition here, but we decided that we were going to find out were they still alive? So did they survive after their surgery? Were they deceased? Could we not find them? Um, and then compare that across the procedures that had been done. Um, this is misleading. This isn't percent mortality. This is, uh, this is 67%. This is 100%. This is 50%. These are all really bad numbers. So all these numbers were pretty bad. This is the very beginning of the, of the project, the very beginning of what um, he was trying to do in teaching people to do neurosurgery um, in the middle of nowhere. When, when, how much yeah. training did he give him before you set somebody free to do a big piece shunt? Or, yeah. Or yeah. So it's a great question. He ended up um, being there for several months and then ended up coming back and doing more hands-on training. We're going to come to another slide that's going to show some of that, um, that training process. Yeah. What would the mortality rates be in a first world country for these? Um, less than 5% probably for most of these. Some of these are a little bit different. Um, so burr hole is usually done for a trauma. So you're gonna have a higher mortality for that. Uh, craniotomy is usually done for trauma. That would also be higher mortality. Skull fracture is also a trauma, although that, those four patients survived, we think. Um, but these things like VP shunts, this was really kind of the most damning of the, the stuff that we found was the VP shunts, which is done for patients who have hydrocephalus, a lot of water in the brain. Um, those patients did not do well. And those patients would, would typically do very well in the United States. Definitely less than 10% mortality. Good question. Compared to what if nothing had been done? I mean, for all of these people, was the alternative nothing? Or, or did they have an alternative? Was, was the alternative to do nothing and, and see them die? Um, that is likely what the alternative would have been. So the community in which this took place was in the, is in the Great Rift Valley of Tanzania. Um, it's a seven hour land cruiser ride probably from the town if you can afford to get into a land cruiser and take the ride. Um, from there, you're into a town that has a hospital, um, but even when you're in the town that has a hospital, uh, whether or not somebody there can actually do these procedures is the other question. Um, certainly a seven hour ride for a patient who's had a head injury, a traumatic brain injury, that's not, can, they're not gonna survive that ride, um, even if they can get a car. So um, yes, it's all relative to some degree, although I think it's always valid to ask the question, you know, is, there, is it, are we harming more than we're helping if we are trying to help someone who's maybe not sufficiently trained as well? So that was the reason actually for this initial study was, should we keep training these, these people uh, to do, who haven't had any surgical training, should we keep training them to do surgery if they are just making things worse? Or if we're providing a false hope or a false sense of security for that community? But the, the system doesn't necessarily support neurosurgery either, so I mean, you have to look at that in context too. system doesn't support neurosurgery in, in, in what way? Well, I mean in terms of um, sterility and OR, post-operative care, all those kind of things. I mean, so I think that that mortality would be more multifactorial than just the skill level of the person doing the surgery. Certainly, there's plenty of things that are confounding on these numbers. Um, you mentioned the OR. This was done in a, it was a former Norwegian missionary hospital. Um, they did have an OR, they do general surgery and OB there. Um, but you're right, so, taking a post-operative neurosurgical patient is very different than taking a post-operative C-section patient. <clears throat> so there are different needs there for sure. I'm glad you guys aren't being too hard on him. We've come up with a lot of good reasons to think this is a good idea. <laughs> Whether or not you guys believed in it or not, he started an NGO and, and went with it. Um, and the NGO that he started was really based on the idea of continuing to train people as opposed to continuing to go over himself. Um, he recognized he was just one person. He recognized he could do all these procedures, but he really wanted to train more people in Tanzania and East Africa in general um, to do these procedures. So they did, uh, they, their mission was to 
advanced medical expertise and care in Sub-Saharan Africa through the training and education of local medical personnel. Uh, through this model, we improve healthcare and medical autonomy by investing knowledge, skills, and time rather than just dollars into the Tanzanian healthcare infrastructure. Um, the idea here, again, was not this is not a short-term mission. This is a long-term training program. Um, and this, this came through with what ended up happening. So you asked about how involved was he and how involved was, were his U.S. partners um, as they developed these programs. Um, number of cases here, um, and then uh, the years, then going time on the bottom. 2005, 2010, and then beyond, these trends continued, I can tell you. So of all the cases, all the neurosurgical cases they did, when they started out, they were about 50-50. So about 50% of the time, there would be a U.S. neurosurgeon in the room when they did the case. But as, as the time went on, the gap got larger. And then eventually, they peaked in 2007 at their training, at the, the, the height of their training of Tanzanian neurosurgeons, and then started to let them train each other. And as that happened, the U.S. involvement came down even more. Um, case, cases stayed high, but there was very few times the, the U.S. neurosurgeon was actually in the room during the cases. And the same thing occurred for complex cases. So patients that were not just a simple burr hole, but maybe a tumor a resection or something like that, something more complex that even held true <clears throat> after um, 2007. So um, if you want to learn more about this, someone wrote a book about it. <laughs> um, so this was a book that was written um, about DeLon, mostly about DeLon um, and, and his experience. I'm going to be honest with you, I show up on it for like six pages in the book. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, I think I'm described as a tall man with a thin beard, which is, they could say a lot worse things about me. Um, so I'll take that. Um, the, the cover of the book actually shows DeLon uh, with Maiega, who is the first uh, Tanzanian uh, AMO, assistant medical officer, that was trained um, to do the procedures. Maiega went on as a non-MD to train other people, including MDs, um, to do a lot of the procedures that he had learned. Um, I just wanted to point out, this is a picture of myself and Maiega um, doing some procedures. I thought that would make a better cover for the book, but I was overruled on that. So. Um, <clears throat> bring this back to what we, we were starting to talk about as far as global health and um, rural health. So the time that DeLon was in, was in Tanzania, there were three neurosurgeons operating in the whole country of Tanzania. Just for context, we have one pediatric neurosurgeon in the state of Montana right now. And how many neurosurgeons in Montana? I don't know how many neurosurgeons there are. You know, there's only one pediatric trained neurosurgeon who's practicing. There might be others who have cabins somewhere, but only one that's actually practicing. <clears throat> so again, access to, appropriate health, access to appropriate healthcare is a global issue. So these are the three places that, uh, that we've been, we've talked about. We talked about in Malawi, identifying the problem. In that situation, was patient death the problem? Or is there something else we need to be looking for? Is there something else I need to, to discover before we tried to propagate or resurrect that project. In South America, we talked about creatively convincing people that what you're doing is important. And these, sometimes that means um, changing the focus of what you're doing. Um, Nancy right now is in Colombia. Uh, two of her co-authors on the paper that, that I showed you are Colombian um, trauma surgeons. And she is there with them now resurrecting their project in a different way using funding that she will likely get from the NIH focused on U.S. funding, focused on U.S. rural health, but translating that research between the two places. And then East Africa, I'm talking about DeLon's program to propagate a system that will, will go beyond you. You're not gonna be there for a week taking out cataracts and leave. You're gonna have somebody else trained to take out the cataracts after you leave. <clears throat> I just thought this was interesting today as I was um, rearranging my slides that uh, according to the last state of the state health um, report from Montana, in 2015, Montana had the highest childhood mortality in the United States. Um, these are mortality rate per 100,000 people. Um, these are age groups down here. These arrows are pointing to the rural um, bar in each of these age groups. The rural bar in each of these age groups, again, is higher than every other group. 
Um, global health and the issues of access to care exist here in Montana. I'm obviously biased as a pediatric intensivist. I care a lot about child mortality, but it's not limited to just children. There is definitely a need for translating um, both global health uh, discoveries and rural health discoveries interchangeably here. And it's really, it's a whole lot easier to do to go to rural Montana than it is to go to uh, Tanzania, Malawi, South America. So I guess my challenge to you, for those of you who are interested in, in um, pursuing global health, is to identify the problem here in the state, to find a way to convince someone that it's important so they'll fund you for it, and then build it so that it will live on after you're done uh, working on it. And then as a side note, failure is part of the process. Um, my, my study, my big study that I did failed. Uh, we had a negative result. Nancy's two big studies that she was, was funded, had huge funding for, failed and she kept going and still has done wonderful things within traumatic brain injury. Delon's initial data, especially on VP shunts, is really damning. Um, he kept going. So whatever it is you plan to do, failure is going to be a part of that process. Um, going back to what we talked about, head and the heart, you know, is there room for both? I think there is. I think there's a room for um, having an emotional attachment to doing global health, and there's also a room for having an academic approach to it, knowing that what, if what we're doing in Tanzania was the right thing to do, um, knowing if the, the methods of studying childhood um, sudden death in malnutrition was the right thing to do. Um, there's a, a place for that. But I think as an extreme example, if anyone reads the book, I'm just going to spoiler alert here. But um, the heart part of medicine. When Delon was back for one of his trips in Malawi, actually on the trip I was on the first time, he met this wonderful woman named Karen who was a Dutch pediatrician who was there. And um, these are actually photos from the wedding that they had on the airstrip of the hospital um, that was attended by everyone in the village. And this is Maiega, again, his, uh, his best man. So definitely some heart involved uh, within global health. Um, it's, uh, there's a place for both. So with that, and a couple minutes early, thanks for letting me share some of this with you. And if anyone has any questions or any other comments, let's chat, yeah. Um, so, with, this, with Montana and the state of Montana, can you comment on what you see are some of the barriers for getting, you know, uh, better health services throughout the state? And can you also comment on telemedicine and the use of telemedicine to provide health services when the, within the state of Montana? You know, in this room, there are probably people who are better qualified to comment on that than I am. You know, I worked here for a year, um, but within my field, Within my specialty of pediatric critical care, I will say that the transportation and getting patients to a center that can take care of them is constantly an issue, especially in the winter months. Um, you might have a patient who's very truly critically ill um, in, a, in a, a critical access hospital somewhere that just can't be moved. And so there's a lot of phone conversations that occur to try to manage that patient from afar. Um, that's a very real thing I ran into here. Um, could telemedicine help that? Um, Maybe. I think there are certain programs that have, uh, have used telemedicine quite a bit. Certain areas, I know that Oregon is one of those places where they've used it quite a lot. Um, telemedicine uh, is only as good as the people on both ends of the, of the line, though. So uh, you have to have a very well-trained provider who is in a critical access area. You have to have somebody who knows how to translate what they want that person to do who's giving the advice as well. Um, for myself, as a, a pediatric intensivist, I've never received formal training on how to do that. It's just something that everyone expects us to do. Um, and yet I'm somebody who gets called a lot from a lot of outside hospitals, wondering how to manage very critically ill, on the edge of death patients. So is there room to better train us? Maybe. Um, but I'm not sure if that's going to be the answer for everything. So there's one up there. In your first one on Malawi, where you didn't um, find the results you expected yeah. and considered that a failure, I hope you will take your um, mentor, Nancy's, example and publish your results. Right. It's not fair to not publish the results. And I know that that's very difficult <laughs> to do. It's actually difficult to get to peer review yeah. on the paper. but. I, <clears throat> I would challenge you and expect you to come back with an answer to Peter. 
check, publish your results so somebody else doesn't go down that same hole. And maybe that would actually be an interesting thing for people in other countries outside Malawi. They need to know that. You know, it's, it's a really valid point. And when the study results came through, and I worked with some colleagues in British Columbia to get these results in, and we kind of sat there and looked over them and felt totally defeated. Um, and I felt kind of duped because I'd seen some of the studies I'd read had very small sample sizes out of Brazil and other countries that said this is, a, this is a technology that could work for these patients. But I didn't see any negative studies that said this won't work. Because no one publishes them. And, and, as, as you, <laughs> and as you said, there are not many places that want to publish those. Open access publishing is helping with that, but open access publishing is not free. And so finding, again, funding to open access publish your negative results is another barrier that we run into with them. But I totally agree. I'd like to publish it. Are you going well, to I, I have another question that connection that relates to what you said earlier, Alexandria, and that is, is it really all that negative? Because there were 11 cases there where people survived. And as you said earlier, they probably wouldn't have survived if there hadn't been any intervention. So I'm not well, sure. That's a Tanzania. That's a Tanzania. Talking about the bound nutrition study that I, I did that yeah, but I mean, I think that, that that's important too. I mean, I would love to see the informed consent um, form on, on that one. It's like, if the person says, do it, it's better than me dying, it's like, is that good enough? See, that's a whole, uh, that's another hour talking about. <laughs> Something will be published. Um, it won't take the form of what the initial study was, um, because again, I don't think that's going to be attracted to a journal. But there will be some notes in there that will probably comment on that. So. And, and I'd like to follow up on another point. You know, I think there, there's several things that, uh, it's really great that John has lectures at the end of this whole series. Um, because I think that you know, this, main, this point that he's trying to make about um, the importance of leaving something behind, training people so that they carry on, so that you don't have to be there, is one that we've seen over and over again in the, in the lecture series, not just this year, but I'm particularly reminded of Brianna Barger's talk about the work that she did in Malawi and how she was able to uh, create a whole NGO that's come on and do some amazing things without her any longer in, in, in Malawi. Um, uh, but the other part of that is the Turn the World Upside Down part, which you were talking about, which is a great book uh, by uh, Chris, um, where he talks about how global health, in global health, we really need to take those lessons from the global south and bring them to the global north. So I want to follow up a little bit, John, because I know that you're sympathetic with that. What specifically have you learned from Malawi, from South America, Tanzania, that you've been able to bring back uh, to your practice, either here when you were here in Montana or what you're doing now in Nebraska? That's a great question. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, one of the things that's, that's talked about a lot is clinical uh, acumen that you gain from being in an environment uh, that doesn't have all the tools and toys that we have here in the ICU. Um, the clinical exam is a lot more important in those settings, and so going back to that as opposed to getting just a CT scan or a chest x-ray, um, we don't have those, those things available. Um, it definitely affects how you treat patients. Um, I think a sense of perspective, too. We talked about you know, how, does, how do these numbers compare to numbers in the U.S. for patients who are getting VP shots, et cetera. Um, having some understanding of um, what to expect. Um, and. As maybe a little depressing, but I guess some some of the fragility that we we would experience with some of these procedures. Um, I think that there's a there's a belief in the U.S. that's very well intentioned that is everybody should live and everybody should live forever. Um, that belief doesn't exist in East Africa, um, doesn't exist in in Malawi, um, and so in my line of work, what I do every day in the ICU is life and death. Um, having a different perspective on on life and death. Um, guided by that has been really, I guess, uh, personally important. So. Um, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, how do you uh, 
adjust coming back to here and going on these very intense trips where you are? Is, is, if you deal with life and death on a daily basis here, it seems like it, is, do you still have this culture of like shock? It gets, it's gotten better. <laughs> um, the first trips are hard, but it's, it's gotten better to go back and forth. The expectations are just different. The scenarios are different. <clears throat> what I expect out of my time in the, East, in the States now is very different than what I expect out of my time in East Africa. Um, there's a difference of uh, setting there that, that helps me have good context clues that I'm not going to expect the same thing. And then, um, there's this section of the Midwest that was rural but had very low traumatic brain injury rates. So I was wondering if there was, if, if that's just access, like accessibility, because there's more people in that region, or if there's been, like, if she parsed out why there are certain rural areas doing better yeah. than others. Yeah, and also I noticed that Maine, which is very much like Montana, have very low rates. You know, they weren't commented on specifically in the paper, and it's something that would be good to look into more specifically. Um, because, you know, whether that's a gerrymandering of of you know, counties over there that makes it look better than it actually is, or whether those areas have less population or just less TBI in general, I'm not sure. Or if it's an artifact of county size, right. um, yeah. where eastern counties are much smaller. Right. And so, I mean, Missoula is, includes Sealy Lake, and western counties tend to be bigger. Yeah. Um, so you get a geographic artifact that may or may not be accurate when you by looking at that unit of analysis. Which is why I was looking at like the Midwestern yeah. region. There was like a significant portion right there was like fairly rural, but they had low. So I, I hate to do this because this is a really, really interesting, and I know you're all very interested, but I'm gonna say one more question <laughs> because we have to get over to the celebration event and Joan is gonna be there. So any other questions you <laughs> might have for him, you can ask on a one-to-one -one basis. No, I think, uh, Chris, I'm going to open really to let Gil ask her question. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering about that chart with the, um, the mortality rates for under 18-year-olds. And it, it said that 15 through 19-year-olds, I guess, were the uh, highest risk for death. And I'm just curious, um, what are the highest risk factors for that age group. It seems pretty high for it to be infectious disease. Um, is, it, is it suicide? And if so, like, what um, strategies would you as a health professional recommend to, to combat that? Yeah, number one cause of death for kids under 18 is trauma. <clears throat> um, whether it's, as Nancy's data parsed out, whether it was violent trauma or, non, or intentional or unintentional trauma. Um, I don't think that this report, I need to go back and read it, I don't think this report parsed out whether it was intentional or unintentional or suicide. I know the report does talk about mental health services in the state, um, that being a, a key area that needs to be improved in the state of Montana. Um, but I don't know the specifics of that. I would say that these kids in particular, I mean this would be a good, this is a, of the ages up there, that's going to be a risk factor for suicide or mental health issues. Did you have something? Um, yes, so we, we lead the nation in low vehicle accidents so with alcohol in an age group and we kill more men, young men than any other state. Yeah. Could you that's hear that? Would you repeat it so everybody could hear it? So uh, it was just mentioned that the state of Montana has more deaths related to drunk driving, alcohol, and motor vehicle accidents. Young men, 18 to 25. Yeah, more than any other state. <clears throat> yeah, and that's consistent across the country, but more so here in Montana. Well, right at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually at this point in time, I tell you what's coming up <coughs> next week. Uh, there isn't anything to say. This is it. Uh, but uh, it's been great, and I really appreciate the support we've had from people in the community as well as the students who have been called in this course. Um, and uh, before I tell you about the celebration event and how to get there, let's give Jonah a real round of